I'd like to talk to you about work that we've been pursuing on single molecule analysis, and in particular, um, how we're using parametric coupling nonlinear oscillators and cavity optomechanics, both to massively multiplex and to get to sort of the promised land in terms of sensitivity. This is a work in progress, and so I really welcome uh, input, people working on this stuff. Um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about stuff that's unpublished, and that's because I don't care where the answer comes from, whether it's my group or another group. Uh, we just want to get to essentially being able to uh, probe deeply the single cell proteome, as I'll talk to you about. I want to acknowledge at the beginning my collaborators, Alexander Makarov, John Sater, Salem Hane, Mark Dickman, and Amir Safavi Naini, uh, and acknowledge my group, my current group at Caltech on single molecule analysis, Warren Fawn, Ava Ray, Adam Newman, Mert Uxel, and Arda Sekme. And then finally, uh, people who have really um, strongly affected my thinking about this in a positive way are Francois Berger, Hong Tang, Keith Schwab, Oscar Painter, Ron Lifshitz, and Mike Cross. So I first want to tell you about the challenge that we're pursuing, deep profiling of the single cell proteome, and then talk about the technological requirements for this quest. And this will lead us to talking about frequency shift sensing and using cavity optomechanics to do so. And of course, the motivation is the beautiful work that's been achieved in the last decade on getting to the quantum limit with displacement sensing with nanomechanical devices. So I'll talk a little bit about the underpinnings, the historical evolution, and an intuitive picture um, for uh, cavity optomechanics, particularly applied to sensing, uh, and then focus my attention to microwave cavity optomechanics. Uh, as a readout that could provide the ultimate limits of sensitivity for single molecule analysis. But the path forward is complicated and steep still, even after 10 or 15 years of cavity optomechanics. We don't fully understand yet phase noise, line width, and spectral diffusion in microwave cavity optomechanics and how they will affect our ultimate sensitivity uh, for sensing. And then, um, you know, giving homage to Guns N' Roses, uh, there is a very strong regime of nonlinear and chaotic dynamics that we will skirt, if not enter, uh, in order to uh, pursue our quest of the ultimate limits of sensitivity. So we need to be careful, uh, essentially, how we nego negotiate the space. And then I'll talk about our simulations and current uh, experiments at millikelvin temperatures and end with the prospects and perspectives. So first of all, the quest. Uh, we want to profile the single cell proteome. And uh, a single cell has about 3 billion proteins, and these comprise about seven to 10,000 different uh, protein types. And out of that 3 billion, these different proteins have different expression levels, which are uh, indicated on the x-axis, ranging from some proteins, a few have expression levels of 100 million in the cell, and a few are only expressed in few copies. Even these guys down at the bottom that are only expressed in few copies are doing very important work in the cell in terms of signaling, detection of outside threats, uh, controlling DNA expre uh, uh, gene expression, and so on. How do we know that there are 10, 000, 7 to 10,000 uh, distinct protein types per cell? Well, we haven't measured them. In fact, this is inferred from the previous step uh, uh, of the um, hierarchy, namely from a messenger RNA and transcriptomics. So genomics, we can actually probe everything, but for proteins, we can't. So today, only the most prevalent proteins are measurable, and effectively, most of the cellular proteome is opaque to us. We don't, there are many things to discover here, many important things to discover. And so the whole focus of the talk is deep proteomic profiling, going deep uh, into uh, this domain. Now, the current prevalent technique for uh, proteomics is mass spectrometry, and mass spectrometry uh, I liken to essentially having a bunch of different puzzles, namely all the different proteins in a cell. You put them into a pot, you break them all up into small pieces that you can handle and measure with high resolution, and then you try to use bioinformatics at the back end to figure out which pieces go to which puzzle, 
uh, and make sense of the whole thing. And obviously, this is a very complicated prospect. Um, it's been approved a little bit with top down, what's called top-down mass spectrometry, where you, in fact, first do a protein separation. So you have different pots with a restricted strata of proteins, a restricted number of proteins. So now you have separate groups of puzzles, not the whole you know, uh, con conflagration of puzzles all put together into the same pot. But still, this is difficult. It's not single molecule, and it cannot lead to essentially profiling the proteome of a single cell. So what's been emerging in mass spectrometry is a different technique called native mass spectrometry, and that allows you to, instead of chopping proteins up, uh, if you can measure large masses with high resolution, actually look at these intact proteins. And so now we can think of essentially uh, having distinct puzzles and solving the species one at a time, although this is not a single molecule technique, so you require very arduous sample purification techniques in order to pursue this so you don't have multiple proteins in the same pot. Requirements for pushing this native mass spectrometry to the single molecule limit, which is what we need in order to profile a single cell's proteome, are the following. We need sensors with sufficient mass resolution to disambiguate nearly identical species. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, when I talk about isobarism. Second, we need sensors with sufficient capture cross-section to accommodate a protein complex, but yet having this high resolution. Third, mass is probably not enough. In order to disambiguate species, we need to do multi-physical analyses to separate and cluster distinct species into a high dimensional configuration space. And once we've clustered them, then we can think about actually trying to identify what's in these different clusters in this high dimensional space. And then finally, we need to measure billions of proteins in a single cell, but we need to measure millions of cells. So we need extremely high throughput. Okay, so sufficient mass resolution. The name of the game is frequency shift sensing. We're gonna let molecules um, accrete, physisorb onto the NEMS, uh, and that little added mass is going to give a frequency shift. And that frequency shift then we detect. And we need to have, at the end of the day, something approaching single Dalton resolution if we're going to measure one molecule, one protein, one protein complex, and in the cell, uh, the masses range from a kilodalton, that's a thousand AMU, to several uh, megadaltons. And again, to disambiguate mass, we need to have single Dalton resolution. But this poses a problem. That single Dalton resolution has only been demonstrated by Adrian's group so far. Uh, his paper on uh, yoctogram mass sensing with a single wall carbon nanotube. But we can't use those in this quest because of the size scale. They just won't accommodate the proteins. Okay, so we need to use conventional structures, larger, stru maybe not conventional, but we need to use larger structures that can accommodate the proteins. And so I'll talk about using graphene. Now, if we can measure mass with single Dalton resolution and we can measure these proteins, there is still a problem. And this is why I say we need to go to multi-physical sensing. Because there can be different proteins that have essentially degenerate mass. If you have a megadalton protein, essentially it can be decorated by what are called post-translational modification that change the function or the activity of the protein and these variations can range from a few to several thousand Daltons. So one protein and another protein that are different can essentially have different, be in different post-translational modification states and essentially overlap in mass. We're going to be firing, second is we're going to be firing our molecules into the vacuum phase. And in doing this, they retain some of their waters of hydration. Uh, the closest ones, and that keeps them in nice um, conformation. Uh, they don't fragment, uh, and this is uh, John Finn got the Nobel Prize for 
uh, electrospray ionization. This is really important. But there can be other atoms that are actually added to the mix. And if you have a big protein that's in the range of several million Daltons, you know, this can add to hundreds of Daltons to the mass. And again, give uncertainty or variation for the same protein type, it can have a different mass. And then finally, just isotopic variations in a mega Dalton protein. If you think about the different species like carbon-12, carbon-13, nitrogen-14, nitrogen-15, these can give sort of a standard deviation of mass for a mega Dalton protein of order 40 Daltons. So our answer to essentially going beyond mass uh, and clustering things in this high dimensional space are to look at other physical properties uh, of these individual molecules that are absorbed to our NEMS. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but um, many of you know that we've pursued with John Sater um, and Salem Hane uh, inertial imaging that allows us to get the shape of molecules. And there are other techniques, including absorption calorimetry, infrared action spectroscopy, this is, um, and uh, uh, single charge electrometry, and so on, that will give us orthogonal axes of measurement. And so this is the direction that we're pursuing. Fourth requirement is high throughput. Again, we'll have a single cell. We need to measure every protein to get at these rare proteins, these needles in the haystack. Is this feasible? Well, it is if we actually massively multiplex our NIM sensors. We have to have these single Dalton sensors, and if we had 1,024 of them, this is the, what I'm actually pursuing with the instrumentation behind me, um, 1,024 of those with a typical integration time of a millisecond and 20 minutes of acquisition will get us up to billions of protein throughput. So if we have a bunch of these machines chunking along, we can do thousands of uh, cells per day, the complete proteome of thousands of cells per day. All right, let me move on then to talking about uh, the technological path, particularly next generation frequency shift sensing. So if we think about minimum resolvable mass, for frequency shift sensing, it's limited by two factors. Uh, first, the mass responsivity, and this is a property of, of the devices themselves, and then the frequency fluctuation noise, because if the frequency shifts, I have to be able to resolve that above the frequency uncertainty. So as I said, the mass responsivity is determined by device geometry and materials. It goes like the fourth power, so we get 12 orders of magnitude improvement in going from MEMS to NEMS. Three orders in, di in dimension, so th 3 times 4 is 12, and we've proven this. The frequency uncertainty is actually, is usually characterized by the Allen deviation, which is a function of the measurement time tau, uh, and this is basically a function of the phase noise spectral density. And so just to give you a really quick sort of feeling or uh, uh, intuition about what drives this, if we go to the phaser plane, um, sort of in phase and quadrature, um, the uh, magnitude uh, uh, of the measurement and the phase uh, of the measurement are uncertain because of fluctuation processes. And the tangent to the circle is phase noise and perpendicular, uh, in other words, the radi radial fluctuations are the amplitude noise. We can get rid of amplitude noise, but phase noise is going to plague us. This is determined by small forces. And if we go uh, to complex amplitudes, as I've represented here, we extract an equation of motion for phase. This is a simple picture without damping. Um, we end up have, driving with the resonator force noise and feedback noise. And one fundamental limit is thermomechanical fluctuations, which are white. And so if we put this in, essentially the spectral density for phase noise uh, shows that essentially we have phase diffusion that's proportional to absolute temperature. This is thermomechanical noise uh, and uh, it results in phase diffusion. Now, if you use thermomechanical noise to predict what the mass sensitivity is, uh, this is a plot from a paper organized by Sebastian Entz uh, and published uh, in collaboration with us in 2016. If you use thermomechanical noise, in fact, 
what we find is that for the whole range of, this is a little bit apples and oranges comparison here, but for the whole range of resonators that have been measured, measured as of 2016, essentially the measurement is three to four orders of magnitude worse. And this has plagued us uh, for the longest time and limited us to mass sensitivity for larger devices that can accommodate proteins to the range of 10 kilodaltons and up. Although we've pushed it down now uh, in my group um, using piezoresistive sensing uh, down to about five, uh, five kilodaltons, maybe a little bit lower. And the main problem here is in fact that you can't get the devices cold because piezoresistive sensing requires that input current. You can't take them down to low temperatures. We find that essentially our devices hang up at around 50 Kelvin. Meanwhile, cavity optomechanics has given this, these beautiful results on displacement sensing over you know, the past uh, 10 years or so. This is a chart that um, Ava put together. It's not an exhaustive list but it shows you that we can get to the quantum limit uh, with cavity optomechanics displacement sensing. And so it seems to have a lot of promise uh, for single molecule uh, analysis. And indeed, cavity optomechanics has been applied, uh, but the hope for improvements uh, have not been achieved so far. Uh, the first paper that I know of um, was uh, from the Hossein Zadeh group uh, in 2013. And they got picogram resolution, which corresponds to uh, a minimum resolution of 602 gigadaltons. And obviously this is an orders of magnitude step backwards uh, from where we are now. A more recent paper uh, from a collaboration led by Sebastian Hentz uh, has used optomechanics and an innovative uh, platform device coupled to an optical resonator. Uh, but their phase noise, even at liquid uh, nitrogen temperature, also has taken a serious step back. And so the mass resolution here is almost a megadalton. So again, we need orders of magnitude improvement, factor of a million to get down to where we need to be. So our objectives are to narrow the NEMS resonant line width and to suppress this spectral diffusion. In other words, we need a small Allen deviation. And so as I'll show you momentarily, we're looking for an Allen deviation about 30 times lower than we have right now at 20 milli-degrees. Right now, um, for unknown reasons, we're at about three times 10 to the minus eight, uh, and we'd like to be at 10 to the minus nine. And we have ideas. So microwave cavity optomechanics, this is what we're using now. And let me just refer to one paper momentarily to sort of exemplify uh, the process. We use a superconducting, uh, in this case, a coplanar waveguide resonator, capacitively coupled to a NEMS resonator. The NEMS resonator essentially frequency modulates the cavity capacitance, and that effectively frequency modulates the resonance. And we can think about this basically as being if in sort of a lump circuit picture, we have a NEMS that's at six megahertz, we have a cavity that's at seven gigahertz. Um, there is a sort of a static background capacitance associated with the coplanar waveguide resonator and a little teeny capacitance that's about a million times smaller than the sum of these static capacitances but none the, that, that's varying because of the NEMS motion, uh, but nonetheless, that's, uh, it's big enough to actually detect using cavity optomechanics. So the way, um, for those of you who don't know this, um, the way this is actually used is essentially as a threshold detector. detector. Let me change my pointer here to laser pointer. Um, we pump with a laser, that's essentially one NEMS resonance frequency below, if we're doing red sideband, so-called red sideband pumping, below the cavity mode. And if the NEMS is moving, if the NEMS is moving, then we can combine one phonon from the NEMS and one phonon from the pump to create a phonon to excite the cavity. Notice I call this threshold detection because if the NEMS are not moving, we don't get any cavity excitation. And the cavity mode, basically enhances. The cavity typically has an unloaded Q of a million for the cavities 
we and others are making at state of the art, uh, and when you actually couple uh, it effectively uh, in and out, um, the loaded queue is about uh, 100,000. So we start with the NEMS for the sake of argument, let's say 10 megahertz, and then three orders of magnitude higher in frequency is the superconducting cavity. Um, the NEMS emits a phonon. We use a pump that's below uh, resonance of the cavity, and these two nonlinear, uh, nonlinearly combine to give us a pump photon and to excite the cavity. But there's also back action. The cavity emits uh, photons, and this can essentially decompose into one pump phonon uh, and one cavity phonon. And so this actually back action excites um, the cavity. We can also apply separate NEMS actuation to pump it up and to give us good signal to noise ratio. Now there's a simple model that explains not the back action, but basically cavity optomechanics. And I uh, spend two minutes here uh, talking about it because I don't think it's widely appreciated how simple cavity optomechanics is. Um, we, if we assume based on the picture that I gave you that cavity optomechanics essentially is a simple capacitive modulation of a tank circuit, uh, we can go through the classical analysis uh, and I won't belabor you, you know, all the details of the points here. You can actually look at it uh, in the slides afterwards because the talk will be online. Um, let me just skip through this. Essentially, the result gives us an expression for the output voltage that is a cosine of a sine. And whenever you see a cosine of a sine, you know you're going to expand it in, in Bessel functions. You know this from single particle modulation of en energy levels in quantum mechanics, or more simply, you know this from frequency modulation analysis. And so the first few terms of the simple analysis uh, are for J0, if you turn off the, um, the excitation, uh, sorry, the NEMS excitation, uh, you just get the cavity resonance, but once the NEMS starts moving, you get the lower sideband and the upper sideband, and then you have a whole host of higher terms. Okay, so a couple of points here. First, if the NEMS isn't moving, I've made this point before, all the sidebands vanish and only the cavity resonance persist. And so I call this threshold detection. Second, people usually linearize. If you go to input-output formalism for cavity optomechanics, first step is to linearize. But we may not be working in the linear regime, and I'll show you some really uh, you know, striking examples of this um, at the very end. So, And then finally, I've already made this point as well, that if the sideband falls right within the cavity resonance, and of course we orchestrate this to actually happen, then we can use the cavity resonance to enhance that particular sideband's detectability. Okay, I'm going to go through this part really fast because this is just meant to be sort of a historical picture uh, about all the things that have led up to cavity optomechanics. Um, sometimes the literature gives you the feeling a little bit that cavity optomechanics just sort of emerged uh, you know, spontaneously. There's 150 years of background to this. And so my view of the evolution of cavity optomechanics is the following. It started with people looking at parametric resonance excitation and then amplification. And as I said, this has like 150, 160 year history in open systems. But then people realized that you could parametrically couple oscillators or nonlinear oscillators and get them to exchange energy, the analog, the classical analog of Rab Rabi oscillations. This is all in the classical regime. Just like I explained, um, that the fundamentals, what's at the core of cavity optomechanics is purely classical physics. Now where the quantum stuff comes in is when we actually isolate our systems enough and take uh, the amplitudes or the drives down to low enough energy um, where we can actually induce or witness single quantum exchanges between these systems. And then of course the quantum fluctuations. Uh, are, are not classical. We actually have to use quantum mechanics to describe them. The story starts with none other than Faraday in 1831, who noticed basically ripples in wine glasses and correctly understood but couldn't prove that in fact 
this was degenerate, degenerate parametric excitation uh, of these surface waves in the wine glass. This also uh, basically derives from the physics that Euler understood about instabilities, and especially the instability of a beam buckling, um, uh, uh, beam buckling physics. So I'll just get through this quickly. We've used the Euler technique, and others have as well. Uh, this is some work from the early 2000s uh, from Rasul Karabalan, Mike Cross, Ron Lifshitz, uh, collaboration with all these guys, showing that we could actually uh, get in these simple, we call them depletion mode NEMS, uh, piezoelectric, aluminum nitride piezoelectric NEMS, um, beautiful examples of degenerate parametric actuation. And in fact, that tongue that I showed you, the Arnold tongue, describes the transition between ampli amplification, parametric amplification below threshold, to parametric oscillation above threshold. Then what about the degenerate, the non-degenerate case? Oh, sorry, this is still degenerate. Degenerate parametric uh, amplification, we used Lorentz force actuation and also these depletion mode NEMS, uh, and we were able to get uh, quality uh, factor enhancement from uh, 1,000 to you know, 120,000 at room temperature and gain up to 1,000. And I, I think it's really important to mention here that the first people who actually thought about using mechanical devices for parametric amplification um, were Dan Ruger and uh, Peter Gruder around, I forgot when it was, 1990, something like that. Okay, so next piece of this is parametrically coupled nonlinear oscillators. This also has a beautiful classical background that date back, dates back to the 1950s. Um, here's a pair of coupled um, resonators, and they're coupled uh, by a nonlinear ferromagnetic component. And this was invented by Harry Sewell, a Bell Labs guy, uh, in, in, the, in the late 1950s. Another Bell Labs guy, William Lewisell, um, wrote a book and published it in 1960, uh, and he actually has a complete chapter talking about parametric coupling uh, of nonlinear elements. So this is not new. 1967, uh, Stratonovich published a paper where he also considered uh, time-varying capacitances, thinking about varactors, coupling two resonant circuits. And uh, the famous NIFE, uh, and there's his book, 1979, also considered parametric excitation of two in, internally resonant oscillators. And there's a really nice paper that came out in 1999, well before the, you know, the golden era of cavity optomechanics, talking about uh, coupled nonlinear oscillators. And this is in sort of the teacher's journal, the American Journal of Physics. And they do experiments and do some analysis and show uh, predicted instability of both the symmetric and anti-symmetric mode for these different gliders on tracks where they actually have a linear spring and a non-linear spring associated with um, uh, repelling and re uh, repulsive interactions of fixed magnets. Our first work, the first work that I know of of using nanomechanical or micromechanical devices for non-degenerate coupling uh, was unpublished work that's in Rasul's thesis from 2008 using a pair of these depletion mode NEMS resonators that are coupled by a, uh, an elastic ledge. And here are the two modes. And basically, he drove them at the sum frequency and showed an Arnold tongue. Four years later, uh, there, and then four years after that, two really beautiful papers that sort of exemplify this. One is from Yamaguchi Group at NTT um, using two modes uh, of a uh, MEMS cantilever uh, to do both red sideband and blue sideband pumping. Uh, and then a paper in 2016, four years after that, uh, by uh, a GVAC Parpia's group uh, showing a disc graphene resonator and again um, effectively showing these sort of coupled mode phenomena. Now, cavity optomechanics, the quantum mechanical sort of version of this, really has its roots uh, in the Raman effect. 
light scatters elastically um, off of uh, atoms. But in fact, if we include um, coupling of the electronic and the vibrational excitations, we can have uh, inelastic scattering. And either this can be an energy loss where the output uh, photon is at a lower wavelength than the input photon, or if at the onset of the absorption we actually use a vibrationally excited state, we can actually have a higher energy, an anti-Stokes um, uh, line. And of course, the single molecule sort of version of this is going to cavity quantum electrodynamics. Here's a picture from one of Jeff Kimball's papers, my colleague here at Caltech, um, showing the James Cummings uh, Hamiltonian and showing essentially coupling of light in a cavity to a single atom. So this is basically the physics that underlies cavity optomechanics. But the birth of the uh, field was really heralded by two uh, people thinking theoretically. The first is Vladimir Braginsky in 77, thinking about using these cavity optomechanics processes as this sort of threshold detection that I mentioned earlier. And then my buddy Mark Dickman, a previous co-organizer of FNS, uh, in his landmark paper in 1978, talking not only about this threshold detection, but about the possibility of heating and cooling uh, using these parametric, uh, uh, parametric processes. And this was first demonstrated cavity cooling of a microlever in 2004 uh, by Karai and Metzger, uh, and then essentially mechanical modes coupled to optical devices was first um, really uh, strongly manifested in a strong coupling regime by Kerry Valhalla, and then graduate student, I think, uh, Tobias Kipp Kippenberg and others um, at uh, Caltech back in 2005. And that really was the onset, these high quality optical devices with really strong coupling that heralded uh, this past 15 years of activity of cavity optomechanics. Okay, I spent a little bit more time than I wanted to on that, but I thought it's useful. So let me give you a, a, an example design target for actually applying this um, to single molecule analysis. So if I say that I'm going to use an EMS resonator at 10 megahertz, and I say that I can achieve, and I think we can, an Allen deviation of 10 to the minus 9 at low temperatures, then the minimum resolvable frequency shift is about 10 millihertz. If I want to measure a Dalton, then that Dalton better uh, be resolved at 10 millihertz because that's my frequency resolution. And so that says I need a mass responsivity basically of 10 millihertz per Dalton, okay? And for thinking about big molecules, how big is the frequency shift going to be? Well, if I put a three megadalton molecule in there at 10 millihertz per Dalton, that's gonna give me a frequency shift of 30 kilohertz. So I use this separation when we, we actually uh, multiplex the devices, we'll frequency multiplex them and we'll try to separate them by tens of kilohertz so they won't overlap. So how can we achieve this mass responsivity of 10 millihertz per Dalton? That's pretty tough, but it's achievable. Um, so basically, if we use the expression for the mass responsivity, with a 10 megahertz resonator, we'd need about a 1.3 femtogram modal mass. That immediately makes us think about graphene. And at the end of the day, a 10 megahertz graphene disk resonator uh, would have a diameter of about one and a half microns. This is now big enough to accommodate protein complexes. So this is the target. Now, how about actually detecting this? So let's think about going to the blue sideband. In the blue sideband, we can pump and we, uh, above, and we can actually excite both the cavity mode and the NEMS. So in other words, we take that blue uh, pump tone and we'll split it through a nonlinear process to excite both the NEMS and the cavity. Okay, I'm gonna skip through the, and we can also um, separately actuate it if we want. Um, Bottom line is that the effect of this blue sad band pumping is above threshold, we can actually go into oscillation. And once we're in oscillation, depending on the strength of the pump, we can get a much narrower line than we do at the onset of the phenomena. 
So the question then that we have, thinking about molecular sensing at millikelvin temperatures using microwave cavity optomechanics, is what regime provides us the best frequency shift sensing? Well, the red sideband regime will basically broaden the mode, although it cools it, but it broadens the mode. So that's not a good place to go for frequency shift sensing. So blue sideband looks like our ticket. It gives us line narrowing, mode heating in the sense of sort of um, inverting the population. And above threshold, we can actually have this direct analogy of lasing in the mechanical domain and extreme line narrowing. So we need to look at what the frequency stability is uh, above threshold when we're lasing effectively in the mechanical regime for these parametric oscillations. And so that's what we've been doing both through simulations, uh, room temperature experiments, and then experiments at 10 milli-degrees, um, which are currently being led by Eva Ray, who's a postdoc in my group. And the devices that we're exploring are some devices that were made uh, by Mahmoud uh, Kaleh uh, in Oscar Painter's group, and they've generously uh, given those for our current investigations. Um, we're doing these on a hor horizontal dilution refrigerator that allows us, uh, ultimately will allow us to have line of sight access so we can actually send in a biomolecular beam to the nanomechanical devices. And Ava's experiments carried out at a base temperature of 12 milli-degrees the device is probably at 20 or so, it's hotter than base temperature, show that for red sideband pumping, uh, we get line um, a broadening, but for blue sideband pumping, we actually get down, line narrowing down to sort of the single hertz level. Now the problem though is, as I mentioned, that we're not quite yet where we need to be in terms of the Allen deviation. We're a few times 10 to the minus eight, we need to be at 10 to the minus nine to have single Dalton resolution. Uh, and so we have ideas uh, we don't fully understand yet, or we haven't fully characterized what the um, limiting um, uh, fluctuations are. Uh, and, but um, you know, we'll pursue on this. Uh, we'll continue pursuing this, and we also, um, you know, are very interested in embarking on theoretical uh, collaborations to actually understand what's going on. So, questions. How can we best extract the optimal sensitivity for frequency shift sensing? What are the fundamental and practical limits to line narrowing in the blue sideband pumping regime? What limits the phase noise in this regime? And can we actually get this extra factor of 30 or so, uh, so we can do, do single Dalton res, uh, resolution? And there are strong nonlinear dynamics in this blue sideband pump regime. There are regions where we see nonlinear or chaotic dynamics. And so we need to find protocols and regimes of operation where we can have stable, um, stable oscillations. And if time, uh, I'll actually show you this uh, directly. So in terms of the nonlinear dynamics, there are many papers that I, I could quote, but one of the nice ones is from Oscar Painter's group showing um, this regime in parameter space uh, where uh, you can actually see, uh, you know, some of these attractors and nonlinear dynamics. In terms of line width and understanding line width, it's the ultimate limits, I would say, still haven't been firmly established, especially for application and sensing. But two of the most important papers, to my mind, are from Hong Tang's group at Yale, one in 2012 and one in 2014 that say something very fundamental that we have to consider. In the 2012 paper on back action limits uh, on these self-sustained optomechanical oscillations, they point out that as you increase the magnitude of the pump, you're gonna be swinging essentially the cavity resonance, your frequency modulating the cavity resonance over a large range. And ultimately this will cause you this sort of rapid sweeping uh, of the resonance will cause you uh, essentially to saturate in terms of the minimum uh, line width that you can attain. So this will ultimately negate line wear narrowing improvement with extremely strong pumping. And then in 2014, um, they had a really nice analysis using quantum Langevin form formalism showing that the phase noise of blue sideband oscillations above threshold contain contributions from thermomechanical noise, 
of the uh, device, photon shot noise, and low frequency noise from the pump itself. And so for the cavity detected resonance, these fluctuation processes impose fundamental limits on the minimum line width and the spectral diffusion that's attainable with blue sideband pumping. So accordingly, you know, this scheme that we're talking about for blue sideband pump cavity uh, detection, it's going to contain additional noise beyond that from the NEMS itself. So this gives us thought about or pause about exactly what the right way to apply this is. So let me conclude this part of my talk. And Ava said I could have a couple more minutes at the end uh, to tell you about something that's really fun. Um, the conclusion so far is, first of all, this is really a steep climb. And so, you know, I'm just spilling the beans and telling you where we are, even though we haven't published, um, you know, our current results, because I welcome anybody who can actually contribute to this. Our goal is to get to single molecule understanding the single molecule proteome. And there's lots of technical challenges. And anybody that contribute to this, you know, more power to you. Please do. Blue sideband pumped uh, microwave cavity optomechanics holds great promise for NEMS-based single molecule sensing because it's a threshold detection, no MEMS motion, no signal, and it's ultra low power. And this is allowed, you know, uh, contrary to, for example, piezoresistive sensing, this allows you to cool the device to millikelvin temperatures and attain the quantum limit. There are, however, caveats that I just mentioned with strong pumping. There's extra phase noise, extra noise processes beyond those in the NEMS themselves. And then beyond a certain point, uh, the benefits of strong pumping fail uh, for reasons that are mentioned in that 2012 paper from the Hong Tang group. And I would say at present, although a lot is known, the full potential of these phenomena has neither been fully understood nor harnessed for sensing. Now, it turns out following, this is the sort of addendum to my talk, it turns out that this idea that cavity optomechanics is purely classical, at least unless you, in, unless you get down to the limit of single phonon or photon exchanges, allows us to think about building cavity optomechanics, classical cavity optomechanics experiments at room temperature on printed circuit boards. And the ingredients are the following. A high Q quartz crystal oscillator that's resonating at 21 megahertz, actually now 30 megahertz, and we can get those with quality factors of 250,000. We can pull that quartz crystal resonance by adding a few picofarads of capacitance to them and so instead of just adding a fixed capacitor, we can use a low dissipation varactor diode and then frequency tune with a voltage uh, that cavity resonance. For the mechanical resonator, I can just buy a part now, which is a high Q MEMS resonator, Qs of up to 50,000, three orders of magnitude down in frequency, sort of you know like cavity optomechanics experiments, 30 megahertz for the cavity, 30 kilohertz uh, for the mechanical resonator. And then we mediate the coupling fully in the electrical domain because the quartz crystal and the mechanical resonator both have uh, electrical transducers between, that convert between the mechanical and the electrical domain. So here's the conceptual picture. We have a cavity and a MEMS, and we couple them uh, with a varactor diode. This allows the MEMS, when it's moving, to parametrically modulate the cavity resonance. And then I have reverse coupling, which allows me to back action drive uh, the MEMS itself. And then I have a series of experimental controls that I can add. I can put my pump on the cavity. I can put a DC bias to bias the uh, varactor into its sweet spot. Uh, I detect the output. I can actually directly drive the MEMS and I can use different types of noise to actually shape the response of the system and understand how the, all the noise gets mixed together in the spirit of that 2014 paper from the Tang Group. Now it's a little bit more complicated than I just stated because I'm doing everything in the electrical domain. And I can illustrate the complications as follows. So here's forward coupling from the MEMS through amplifiers low pass filters. This is basically low frequency modulation of the cavity resonance. And then I have the back action drive of the MEMS. I sense the electrical signal. If cavity optomechanics is operative, 
um, there will be a low frequency signal on the uh, quartz crystal itself. I'm actually though going to do differencing between a cavity that's pumped and a cavity that's not pumped because if I have any feed through between essentially my drive of the varactor, remember it's in the electrical domain, and my pick off of the low frequency signal, I can just make an electrical oscillator. That's not what I'm interested in. Now, one of the nice things is I can read off both the high frequency and the low frequency separately in this circuit. Okay, so let's take about uh, take a, a little bit more detailed view of actually what we're doing. First of all, this is non-reciprocal coupling, which is uh, contrary to, um, and it's in some sense more advanced, if you will, or more refined anyway, uh, than what's done in, in conventional cavity optomechanics, because we can actually control separately the forward and the reverse couplings. Okay, so if the MEMS uh, is basically thermally, or in this case it's thermal because we're at room temperature, thermally vibrating, that is converted into the electrical domain by the electrical transducer that has a responsivity R0 for R out. We can amplify and condition that signal and then drive the varactor diode. And my coupling is basically D omega DVV, that's the varactor voltage VV, okay? And that frequency shifts the resonator. And just like in cavity optomechanics, I can actually describe the forward uh, gain and make an analogy to essentially the uh, the vacuum level coupling in cavity optomechanics, which I'll do momentarily. The reverse coupling, I can also actually completely mediate and change, tune at will. Uh, and the reverse coupling basically is, I take that low frequency signal uh, that's created by cavity optomechanics from one side, I null out uh, anything that's fed through from the other side, uh, I process it, strip off anything that's coming through that's at high frequencies, uh, and then apply it through the transducer, uh, the input transducer uh, of the mechanical uh, resonator, uh, and that gives me basically my back action drive. Now, I mentioned the challenge. We're driving with an electro a big electrical voltage here uh, to actually shift the varactor, and then we're trying to sense really teeny low frequency signals that happen at the other side of the resonator. And then we're going to sense that and then use that to feed back and drive the varactor. There is direct electrical coupling that can make an oscillator. And it turns out that the, the crystal resonator itself suppresses that by about 100 dB. Okay, and that's shown here. Okay, there's the varactor drive and the sense circuit is about 108 dB down. So what this says is that whatever the back action signal is, I can't apply any more amplification than about 105 dB, otherwise I'm going to make an oscillator, okay? Now, if I use this balance circuit though, in principle, in principle, I can actually suppress that signal by comparing it against the signal that's fed through in the absence of a pump on a whole separate circuit here that allows me to reference and subtract out this feed through signal and for the simulations, I can get infinite suppression, but realistically in circuits, we get 60 to 80 dB of suppression. And that's still sufficient to allow us to get to very strong coupling regimes as I'll describe. So this is the full circuit. It's obviously much more complex than the simple pictures that I've shown you, but it actually gives good performance. The cavity in the initial implementation is at 21 megahertz with a Q of 268,000. That gives us a line width about 80 hertz. And using a 13 volt, negative 13 volt um, reverse bias, I can actually shift up to two kilohertz that resonance and that's 28 line width. So we're in the fully sideband resolve regime. Meanwhile, uh, the NEMS Q uh, has a damping rate which is much smaller than the damping rate of the cavity. Now, let me talk a little bit about coupling and cooperativity so you know where we are. The, zero, the single phonon coupling strength in cavity optomechanics is typically defined by uh, the, the frequency responsivity um, with position times uh, the zero point fluctuations. And in our case, we can translate this into the electrical domain. There's a couple more terms in here. Uh, 
And if we put in what for the zero point motion for the MEMS, uh, basically that gives us a coupling strength of 61 Hertz. And so that puts us basically in really good position uh, in terms of the best experiments that have been ca carried out to date in cavity optomechanics. Also in terms of the cooperativity, this is basically relating this coupling strength to the damping of the NEMS and the damping of the cavity. If I put these damping rates in um, for this device, we're in very strong, co we, can, we can tune. Remember, I can go from effectively zero coupling to very strong coupling because of the suppression technique that I've described. We're also in a very strong core, we can get into a very strong cooperativity regime where Rabi oscillations can be seen or the classical analog of those. Now the caveat is in order to get into this true quantum limit, the single phonon or photon exchange, we'd have to cool this down since it's, the NEMS are at 32 kilohertz to a microkelvin, so that ain't gonna happen. But nonetheless, cavity optomechanics. So let me just show you some cool things that you can actually see. You can see the full manifestations of cavity optomechanics with this printed circuit board experiments. Here's the, again, we can look separately at the RF output and the low frequency output. So from the cavity and from the MEMS. And you can see uh, for very low pumping, essentially we can see hundreds of milliseconds before the back, this is below threshold, the background fluctuations actually kick the thing into oscillation. And as we start increasing the negative damping by turning up the pump, we can see this onset uh, when we go up an order of magnitude and a, a couple of orders of magnitude in pump power, three orders of magnitude, in fact, um, we can reduce this uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude. And then just slight tweaks uh, of the pump power allow us to enter these weird uh, regimes, you know, showing the attractors in this space. Again, this regime of operation that we need to avoid uh, in order to have good stable operation for cavity optomechanics. So this is at a higher drive level. You can see noise in the cavity. This is the RF envelope. If you zoom in, you could see the RF oscillations at 21.7 megahertz. If you zoom in here, you'll see the cavity oscillations at 32 kilohertz. But you can see that the cavity is not oscillating at a fixed level, but it's actually jumping up and down. As we turn up um, the blue sideband pumping level, this cleans up a little bit. Turning it up further, it cleans up even more. So there are stable regimes to find. We can do uh, Fourier transforms of these. And if we zoom in near the cavity resonance, we can see the blue sideband that we're pumping, the cavity resonance that arises because of the NEMS, uh, and the red sideband as well is excited. And in fact, if we zoom out, these are the three peaks that we were looking at. We can see all those extra J's, uh, all those extra nonlinear peaks that typically people don't look at, but actually exist in the strong pumping regime. Further, this shows one hertz resolution. We can look in one regime of blue sideband pumping and actually see that we're getting very uh, strong line narrowing uh, of the of the MEMS resonance. And then finally, uh, again, we can see all the richness of the chaotic and nonlinear dynamics. Intermittency near threshold of parametric oscillations, relaxation oscillations uh, of the MEMS, which are known in the uh, lore as squedging, which is basically uh, amplitude death, <laughs> another fanciful term, or basically switching on and off of the MEMS oscillations. So that's all I wanted to tell you about. Sorry for going a little bit over, but I hope you thought it was fun to hear about doing cavity optomechanics at room temperature on a print circuit board. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Michael, for this beautiful talk plus head-on talk. <laughs> um, we have a first question in the chat, and maybe, I mean, I would suggest, even though we're over time, we, we, we devote a few more minutes to questions. So the first one is from Alec Pocarell, and he's asking, what is the cause of fluctuations in your system? Okay, well, there's many. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, it's the phase noise fluctuations in the NEMS, which is a combination of stuff we know about and stuff we don't, which we're investigating. Stuff we know about, thermomechanical fluctuations, you know, as per that nice survey that was put together by Sebastian Entz, um, mechanical domain 
multiplicative noise for the NIMS is a couple of orders of magnitude stronger at high temperatures. And it has not yet been investigated at millikelvin temperatures. And that's what we're in the course of looking at. For the other noise in the system, this is described in Hong Tang's paper of 2014, photon shot noise uh, and one over F noise in the laser source in the pump. Those are the dominant, but not the only uh, noise mechanisms. Okay, I see a few more questions uh, in raised hands. I think John Davis was first. I give you the permission to ask your question. Michael, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, really uh, interesting overview. Um, I have a question about when you do the uh, blue sideband pumping and you get into the NEMS lasing, don't you also get a frequency locking of the mechanical resonance, which is going to prevent you from doing the frequency shift mass sensing that you want? Well, uh, no, because the lasing frequency is determined by the NEMS frequency. But it... So but it if it ends up locking, right? Well, no, locking to what, John? If you actually have an external drive, then it could lock to that external drive. But if you don't have an external live drive, sort of the frequency of the lasing is determined by the NEMS resonant frequency. And essentially dropping a molecule is like using a different NEMS, right? It has yeah, a different you're, resonant You're frequency. really actually are driving it by your blue pump, right? It's kind of locking to the cavity detuning between your blue pump and your and your cavity, right? Well, so that's sort of driving it at that frequency. You can be anywhere within the cavity resonance and actually see the NEMS line. So you don't have to be essentially on resonance with the NEMS. But John, what we will do is in fact do a external feedback control to actually make sure that the cavity pump is tuned so we actually maximize the signal. Has anyone actually done that where they've actually done that feedback so they can see the changes in the mass of the of the NEMS when doing a blue pump? Because I... Yeah, the two papers that I mentioned, 2013 okay. and 2020. Okay, okay. Yeah. I haven't seen those. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, um, Alex Eichler also raised his hand. Hi, Alex. Yes, thanks. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, I'm interested in in the high throughput that you that you mentioned. Uh, I think on the one hand, this requires that you sense very fast, right? And and I think I understand um, how you go about that. Um, so the sensitivity is there, but you also need a high refreshing rate in in your in your sensor. And how do you take care of that? So this gets at something that Ava is actually looking at now. Um, so I really like the cavity optomechanics on a printed circuit board because in the, in the course of doing this, you actually pull out all the interesting features that you wouldn't necessarily think about when you do low temperature experiments. Like for example, what is the gestation time involved in turning on your excitation and actually the cavity optomechanics starting up, right? And it depends. It depends on how strong the pump is, how long it actually takes you on out. It's a statistical thing. It depends on having a large enough fluctuation to kick the thing into parametric oscillation. So that depends on the strength of the pump signal. We can control that, but it's still a statistical quantity. Uh, and so this will actually figure into the minimum measurement time uh, that we require uh, in order to detect a frequency shift, for example. Um, am I answering your question, Alex? I'm not well, sure. Well, I, I was more thinking of, of surface chemistry, of how fast the molecule gets desorbed again to oh, make the graphene okay. ready yeah. again for a new one. Yeah, okay. So um, physisorption, uh, essentially the molecule comes in and, you know, within a few picoseconds, you know, remember that uh, nice paper that Vera Sasanova, actually she was on that, uh, that uh, paper of the, the gliders. Uh, she was an undergraduate then. Um, and Paul McEwen actually wrote on a buckyball vibrating on a surface. So essentially the van der Waals interaction between the adsorbate um, and the surface give you sort of picosecond sort of resonant frequency uh, for the system. 
And so that's the time scale. And then there's a damping rate that's, you know, a few cycles, right? So that's the time scale on which this thing will vibrationally relax on the surface. That's really fast. We don't have to worry about that. We do, we do the experiments at low temperature, so the desorption time can be infinite, uh, you know, unless we heat the thing up or fire a laser beam to desorb things. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, were there other times you're concerned about? Alex? I see. So, so they just, they just stay there and, and you, you, you get yeah, you, yeah. little events by, by yeah. different events. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah, exactly. I see. And in the multi-physical case, we want to not only be doing mass sensing, but we want to look at a bunch of different modes so we can do inertial imaging and get the shape, uh, and then other tricks to allow us to get charge and the heat capacity and the infrared spectrum of the molecule. And the infrared spectrum, we're following the inspiration of Sylvain uh, Schmidt's uh, beautiful, beautiful recent work. Thank you. Okay, so I think Adrian is next. Okay, hi. Um, hi, Adrian. Uh, so you, you have a, a, a very nice paper a few years ago about uh, frequency noise due to diffusion of atoms and molecules on the surface of, of atoms, more specifically. So what do you think it happens when it goes at low temperature? Because it, I'm asking this because we really don't understand anything what's happening when we work, for example, with nanotubes and we go at nano at low temperature. So. No, this is a great question, Adrian. So I don't know. Uh, and, you know, at this point, everything is open until we get into this regime with the sensitivity. My intuition is the following, though, that in order to have high surface mobility for adsorbed species. Um, well, you could be at extremely low temperatures, and if your surface is a perfect periodic surface, you can effectively have the analog of block waves for uh, transfer, lateral transfer across that surface. So you can have high mobility for species. But of course, that's not what we have. We don't actually have surface, particularly in our NEMS devices. This is not UHV surface science that we're actually doing. These are crappy, dirty devices, even if we clean them off. Um, so, um, so there will be, um, you know, there will be uh, granularity and potential fluctuations in the surface potential. Now for nanotubes and single atoms, or graphene in single atoms, I don't know. I suspect that graphene, because of its surface undulations just used to, uh, just due to thermomechanical uh, fluctuations, as you know, was described, for example, by Paul McEwen and others, Paul McEwen's group, um, I think those will also serve to greatly impair uh, the surface mobility of those species, even at low temperatures. But the bottom line is I don't know. And it is really a concern if, in fact, but, but, um, but Adrian, we're not looking at molecules. I'd be happy if the, the atoms actually go flying off really quickly, you know, any atoms on the surface. We're looking at these big proteins and protein complexes, and their mobility is going to be kind of less than zero. Well, not less than zero, but their mobility is going to be close to zero. Does that answer your question, Adrian? Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, uh, I think we have two more questions in the uh, Q&A. So the first one is, why aim for single Dalton resolution if the natural variations on the protein mass is on the order of tens of Daltons? Well, because we're not dealing with ensembles, when we're actually looking deep in the proteome, we're looking at discrete proteins, okay? And depending on the state of the cell, the function of those proteins may be different. They may have different, the cell may have programmed them with different post-translational modifications. And if we'd like to know the state of the cell, we'd like to know not only what proteins are there, but actually what state they're in. So it's not ensemble averaging. It's actually looking distinctly, identifying the proteins and identifying the states that they're in. So, as I said, single Dalton resolution, the state of the art is Orbitrap mass spectrometry uh, that was invented by my principal collaborator, Alexander Makarov, you know, who's a big um, you know, manager, uh, vice president of Thermo Fisher Scientific now, but he's still very much a physicist and very much a hands-on kind of guy. So you know, he's very involved in this project. Okay, 
And Orbitrap mass spectrometry gives you millidalton resolution. And you can say, why do I need millidalton if a proton is one Dalton? You know, how can a molecule vary by more than, you know, by less than a Dalton? Well, isotopic variations. And so that gives you a handle. If you have millidalton resolution, it can give you a handle on getting the resolution you need to disambiguate species. I, even though Pierre Maestre and others have said that the quantum limit of mass sensing is a single electron, which is what is that, 600 microdaltons? Uh, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, and I'm not counting on it for the practical kinds of instruments that we're trying to build for proteomics. However, single Dalton resolution is going to go a long ways towards separating in this hyperspace the different species we have, and then to further separate them in hy hyperspace where the mass is nearly degenerate, we'll go to the multiphysical to actually use other properties to separate them. And the goal is, again, we, we need to measure single molecules, we need to identify them, and we need to identify their functional state to tell us what the cell is doing. Okay, thank you. And I think we have uh, the uh, one last question by Xin Chu. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. Would you please give some comments on the non-sideband resolved condition? for applications of mass sensing, especially for radio frequency cavity case. Um, Eva, are, he wants me to comment on the non-sideband resolved regime? I think uh, the non-sideband resolved uh, regime for mass sensing, especially for the, for the circuit board. Yeah. So we can certainly take things with small frequency shifts. So we're in the non-sideband resolved regime. I haven't looked at that for the simple reason that I believe you need to be in the sideband resolve regime to have this really important attribute of threshold detection. If we're in the non-sideband resolve regime, then our pump and our resonant, uh, our resonant frequency and our pump is gonna be in the tail uh, you know, of the cavity resonance. And so the pump is actually going to be partially exciting the cavity. We don't want to do that. We actually want to be, have our pump way far away from the cavity. So only when the NEMS is moving, do we actually see an appreciable signal. And so I, I have, first of all, I haven't really looked at the non-resolved regime, but that's because I have this bias, which could be wrong, uh, uh, that uh, we need that for the threshold detection. And if you or anybody else has intuition that's counter to that, well, I'd love to hear it. Okay, I think this was a beautiful <laughs> closing remark. Um, oh no, there's one last question and the, that we are, we're already so much over time, I'll, I'll take that too. Um, I was wondering if the internal resonance in NEMS would be helpful in these mass sensing applications. So, Internal resonance uh, kind of goes back to, in terms of MEMS and NEMS, the first people uh, that actually used that, to my knowledge, um, was um, uh, mental block here, um, uh, Yamaguchi's group, right? And I, I showed this slide, um, which is basically they used a second mode uh, they used a, a two modes in the same device, and essentially, when you actually pump either, uh, you know, non-degenerately, either red or blue, you can actually couple these through the parametric interaction that's induced by clamping for, uh, you know, essentially clamping forces. Sort of this is beyond simple Euler-Bernoulli beams, but actually thinking about how the modes are coupled um, at the supports or through, you know, beyond. Um, uh, Euler Bernoulli, uh, dy um, you know, classical dynamics. Um, so I think internal resonance is already f uh, a core and fundamental piece um, to cavity optomechanics. Um, and it, in principle, it could be used. Uh, and, and, and of course, it, it's also used uh, in the next, uh, oops, not this one. I went backwards and not forwards. In this paper, uh, beautiful paper from Givet Parpia's group, obviously multiple modes of this graphene 
uh, membrane were used and they're coupled because of the strain uh, at the edges, right? So these are examples. The other mode that you're not essentially looking at is the thing that you call the internal mode. Uh, and, you know, that's part and parcel of what people have been using. This is not what we're thinking about for the NEMS. Um, but we've been going on for a long time, so I probably shouldn't uh, go into great details about that. Yeah, I guess maybe it's time to stop here. Thanks very much, okay. Michael. Um, thanks to everyone for questions and discussions and for hanging on till the end. Um, with this, I would like to thank Michael and the other speakers of this afternoon or morning. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And this closes the first day of the virtual FNS 2021.